All right. Well, let's let's open with a word of prayer again, because I'll I'll just plow into this and we won't be able to to retreat. So, uh, Mr. Cannon, would you mind opening us up? Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here, Father, and we look forward to hearing from you tonight, Father. We just pray that you would bless this time, Father, just again. Uh, just be with Brad as he gives the, the, the lesson, Father, and give us ears to hear. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's a great prayer. Thank you for that, Matt. Because when, when you get into a topic, kind of a, a topic like what we're tackling, it's real easy to get academic about it. Um, you know, because you're studying and you're looking at this and you're looking at that. And, and you know, when I, when I preach on Sundays, it's, it's very easy to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because... I'm, I'm completely dependent. But on this, you know, you get into it and you're studying, you're just kind of all over the place. And I have to remind myself, it's the Spirit who teaches. It's not me. Mm-hmm. Even in looking and doing something topical like this, you have to, you have to constantly... Here's, I guess maybe this is the problem. When you get comfortable teaching, you can become comfortable teaching. And that's not necessarily... And I'm talking scripture, not, mm-hmm. not like school teaching. You have to remain dependent on the Holy Spirit, no matter what it is you're teaching, you know, as we open the Word of God. So I appreciate that prayer. Thank you very much for that. Um, tonight, what we're going to do, well, before we get started, I had an interesting um, thought. Remember last week we talked about the, the shad can. Anybody remember what that is? Who that is, rather? Is he one that kind of brings and shoots? Yeah, yeah, he's the matchmaker. That's, that's yes, perfect. And we talked about last week how the Holy Spirit is the one that where God is, is, well, where the Holy Spirit goes out. And now we're focusing on Jesus, who is eventually, we're going to have the marriage, but then um, Jesus will take his bride. And then at some point, he'll present his bride to his father, because that's what they would do as well. Um, But we really focused on the Holy Spirit. But I came across a really, really awesome scripture, and it was, and it wasn't in, in this study, it was actually preparing for marriage counseling, and I came across it, and it's um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. And, I wanna, and I'm kind of touching back on a topic we covered. I'm not going to stay on it really long, but, but I thought this was pretty neat. Let me read to you what I have written, and then we'll read this verse. Okay, as the Holy Spirit acts, as we talked about last week, as He acts as the matchmaker of the Shatkan, the Holy Spirit... He has to use us in this process as well. He doesn't have to, but He does use us in this process to proclaim the gospel. Because remember, when when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the Holy Spirit who's working through us. It's not just us, again, just like I was talking about with teaching. It's not just us relying on our efforts or our abilities or our talents or anything like that or our... our, um, the way we can speak or, or, you know, that's when we share the gospel, we are, we are, should be fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So to proclaim the gospel and make disciples, Holy Spirit is working through us. So this is the interesting thing that, that hit me. When we enter into discipleship, when we enter into making disciples, be it sharing the gospel, because again, we share the gospel, we make disciples, but there's something real important that happens in the middle there that we aren't able to do. Anybody know what that is? Make somebody bring bring Yeah, we can't convert the heart. We we share the truth, we disciple those people, but the conversion that that's a God thing. That's where God reaches in and pulls out that that heart of stone. That's where they are born again. We we don't do I can't do that. Man, I wish I could do that on some people, but I can't do that. You can't do that, but we share the truth and, and allow God to do Is it. Is that extra pair of glasses still up there? No, they're actually over here. I put them here. Oh. They're quite oh, flowery. Okay. Just, there's, a, there's ones in the window. That's a, I'll just look at it. Oh, they're, they're very, well, they're not flowery. They're I, kind of tortoise. I'm, 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 I'm comfortable in my manliness. <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable in my manliness. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I'll wear, oh, this, I don't know, I don't know what prescription they are. <laughs> Matt is, Matt is hooked. <laughs> I am totally keeping all of this on this recording, by the way. Okay, so... When, when we share the gospel, it's the Holy Spirit who's, who's working through us. And so as we enter into to making disciples and things like that, we, we, we become, and I don't want this to go too heavy. When I say a partnership, it's not an even partnership. We become workers, I don't even want to say alongside, but we're, we're being used by the Holy Spirit to also become, in a sense, 
the matchmaker for the people we're discipling to take them to Christ. Now here's, here's what Paul, Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 11 two. He wrote, For I feel a divine jealousy for you. Now he's talking to the church in Corinth, so he's talking to, to believers. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you. And so there's, there's our word there. There's our language, that covenant marriage language. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So basically what is, what is happening, you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he is devoted to those people that, that he was discipling. And he says a divine jealousy because to him... He is the one with the Holy Spirit, but but I don't I don't want to say with because what what he's doing here is it's it's kind of he understands I think he would understand the study that we're doing and I think he also understands the role of of discipleship because it's not just about the disciple doesn't become um, sort of a notch in the belt of the person who's discipling them. Okay, I, I know in, in seminary we had a problem with this, and I've seen it kind of in, in different circles where people will, will lead people to the Lord, and it's almost like, well, there's another one for me. And it's like they're keeping a tally. Mm-hmm. And, and that was one of the big things that, that I had um, strong conviction against at, at my seminary, because at seminary you would, you would have to, and I think I've explained this, you had to witness to, to eight people at least in eight weeks. Um, but, but And then you'd have to report all that stuff. But one of the things that really bothered me is they would always put, I think it was a monthly magazine out, and on the back they would put number of people witnessed to and then number of people who have accepted Christ. And me, you know, sometimes I can get a little squirrely, you know. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, well, where's the number of disciples being made? You know, that was, that was kind of my thing because it's like, wait a minute. We're, we're, we're kind of taking credit for something that maybe, and I get it, you know, we want to rejoice in what the Lord's doing, but we also, I think, need to be very, very careful on kind of number keeping and stuff like that and, and making sure it's not just a notch, you know, in our belt. So I think the Apostle Paul understood he feels a divine, a divine jealousy. So where's that jealousy coming from? He's not divine. So obviously it's something that the Holy Spirit is working in since he betrothed the church in Corinth to Christ. So in that sense, when we make disciples, we kind of enter into this, this whole scheme of marriage, the marriage aspect of the bride and Christ, uh, the bridegroom and the church and all this. And, and we, we sort of have, it's kind of like being an under-shepherd. We have the good shepherd who's Jesus, the great shepherd. We're an under-shepherd as a pastor, so we have the, the, the great Shad Khan, and we're kind of a lesser Shad Khan. Like, we're involved in that matchmaking sort of thing. So, anyway, I came across that, and it really just struck me as, wow, that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Because the Apostle Paul is using that same language about himself concerning the church. And we know when he says a divine jealousy, he is in no way referring to himself as divine. Yeah. There's just no way. So, anyway, thought that was neat. I didn't, that, just wanted to hit that before we moved on to, to some... Other stuff. So last week we covered um, the the matchmaker, and we covered how far did we get? Let me actually look. Let's see. We covered the matchmaker. We covered the bride price. That's as far as we got. So today, what we're going to cover, um, we're going to look at. Let me see where we are. The marriage contract, that's right, we skipped over this. We're going to cover the marriage contract and we're going to cover the cup of acceptance. And what we're doing, and I want to be careful with this too, this, this now, it's not necessarily becoming something chronological in, a, in an Orthodox Jewish wedding. Um, we're kind of covering some things that we covered in the Old Testament. We saw how God dealt with Israel. Now we're just kind of going down the line. So it's not necessarily following. Um, there may be some things out of order. Um, but again, what we're doing is we're now equating, um, well, we'll get into it. We're, we're now equating Jesus, the bridegroom, and the church, his bride. Okay, I was going to say something, but I don't want to give that away yet. So <laughs> I don't want to use that phrase. So we are going to look at today, first off, the marriage contract, the, the kaduba, the katuba, actually. Katuba, yeah. Okay, and what that literally means is written thing. 
And it's pretty neat what happens. I want you to uh, turn in your Bibles to the prophet Jeremiah. And this is going to give us a little hint of a background to understand. It's, this is going to set the stage for, for, for Christ and the church. So Jeremiah chapter 31, and just want to look at verses 31 through 34. Anybody's interested in reading that, they are more than welcome to... I got it. I oh, see. with those beautiful glasses. <laughs> the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. All right. Thanks, Matt. Did you notice the language in, in what the prophet, what God was saying through the prophet Jeremiah? New covenant. That's a big one. Covenant. He says that. He says, I took them by the hand. So there's kind of that marriage picture of the bridegroom coming to his bride, taking her by the hand. And when did he do that? I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And then he said, my covenant that they broke. That's Remember how we, we saw that through the Old Testament, and then as we went through the book of Hosea, we saw that picture of covenant breaking, but yet there's going to be a restoration of that. That's why that was in the middle of the study. And then he refers to himself as, as Israel's husband, and then again, covenant, all these things. So we can kind of understand that the language is, is, is exactly where we're at in this study. But the point in this is behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Which means what? There was an old covenant. And the old covenant, that's, that's the problem. That's what was broken. So there has to be a new covenant at that point. I found this interesting. Um, in an Orthodox Jewish wedding, and I'm not going to go too far with it because I just didn't, it would be chasing a rabbit and I don't want to go too far down that trail. But, but um, there would be a dowry contributed by both the bride and the groom. Now, when I think of that, and we're going to get into into the the what the what the bride or what the bridegroom or what the groom commits to to the bride during the contract, um, but I want us to remember this because there is a responsibility between the bride, between the groom and the bride, because you remember what is being said here in Jeremiah. Um, he said, "I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, they broke." So who broke the covenant? Did God break the covenant? No, no it, was, it was Israel. So there was a standpoint, or there, there was an aspect of, of Israel to where they had some responsibility in this. And so when we come to faith in Christ, um, and I'll ask this question, I don't, I don't ask it rhetorically. Is there a responsibility on our part when we come to faith in Christ? Yes. To witness. Yes. To witness. What else? What else? We witness is, is one of them. I mean, we have the Great Commission. That's that's a big one. What else do we have? As to worship him. To worship him. There's another one. What'd you say? Talents. Our talents to give him everything that we've got. Uh, anything else? Prayer. I think prayer is another one. Um, I think sanctification. Sanctification is one of those interesting things because. Um, sanctification, we, we have to be fully dependent on the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, there is stuff that we should be doing as well. Now, I'm not even going to try to flesh all that out and, and make sense of it. But the reality is, is, is and again, if we come to, to Christ depending fully upon grace, and Paul talks about this, and then think that we have to earn or maintain our salvation through the flesh, it's, it's totally wrong. So the point of that is, okay, we, we depend upon grace and salvation, we depend upon grace and sanctification, but at the same time, there's a responsibility now that we're believers to, 
to draw near to God. Because if we draw near to Him, what is His response? He draws near to us. He draws near to us. So there's that aspect of that. So when I look at that, I see, but okay... is that the yielding that we're... T- because I think it is. I think it is. But it, but it's more than yielding. When you try to live the Christian life, you can't do it. When you try. Right. When you, when you say, I'm going to do I'm gonna do this. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good. You I think know? yielding is, is part of it. But I also think we got to get the Word. You know what I mean? I can say, hey, I'm yielded to the Lord today. And not get in His Word, and I'm not having that that sweet communion with Him. I'm not His words are not they're not coming to me. And and I'm more and more every time I get in the Word of God. Sometimes I read it. Sometimes I have audio, like when I'm going through the big books of the Old Testament. I'll just sit and listen. And it's just amazing to hear. It's a great way to understand how to pronounce certain words too. But it's just awesome just to listen and just and I read along as I listen too. So I'm getting it twice, and that's a pretty cool thing. If you if you have that ability to listen and read it at the same time, you know you're you're using two sen- senses. Mm-hmm. It's it's beautiful, but um, it's sweet communion. And then that to me transfers into into prayer, and you take the things that you. You know, as we learn about God, then we then we approach Him in prayer. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, and that's again, that's where I'm at. It's yieldedness is definitely a part of that that process, but I think on our parts as well, um, we kind of got to be hitting hitting the pavement too, in the sense of we got to be reading His Word. Um, we have to again draw near to Him, and 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 to me, the best way in, in the renewing of our minds, all this stuff. How does that happen? happens in the Word of God. We read the Word of God. Um, you know, any issue that, that's in the world is going to be covered at some point in the Word of God. So as we read it, our minds are going to be renewed. We need that. Um, so again, that's kind of to me that, that, that idea of the dowry contributed by the groom. And we understand what Jesus has done. We're going to get more into that. But also, we have a responsibility of this. We have, we, we're in a relationship. And it's not a one-sided relationship. Now, he's the one that's, that's the husband, and he's the one that's taken the initiative, and he's done all this. But at the same time, the bride just doesn't sit there sort of like stagnant. And, you know, she's, she's preparing herself. And remember the, the phrase that we always use is she is orchestrating her life around the return of her bridegroom. So that's us. That's what we should be doing. So I kind of see that as sort of... Our part in all of this, that, that we orchestrate our lives, and to me, again, that's, that's the, the process of sanctification. So, um, as we come to this, this idea now, and we look into the, the marriage contract, what it, what it really talks about is the hublins, husband's, hublins, the husband's obligation to the bride... And then it also, and this was very interesting, and I don't know if you had this when, I know you're the, you're the, you're the authority on an Orthodox Jewish wedding because you've been to one. I don't know if they're still doing this. Um, do they still read the marriage contract and have them sign it in the midst of the, of the service? I don't remember what I went to. Okay. And they may not. You know, that's, you know how stuff kind of, there's <laughs> the chupa. It's funny when you when you begin to, to study Hebrew and you listen to people who, who are Jewish. Every time they say an H, it's ch. when we had our Jews for Jesus guy there. He's like, you know, when you go home, and I'm like, I picked. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's not how you say home, but but you just they get into that habit of the. Ch. Um, but you know, probably they would have done this certainly in, in times ago with a marriage contract. It would probably depend also maybe on the level of of orthodoxy for a Jewish wedding. You know, because things are... I'm not saying it was a liberal wedding, but you understand. You know, you kind of move away from stuff. Um, but what would happen in the wedding is they would... The rabbi would read, if it was on a scroll, he would read the marriage contract. And in that... It would explain, of course, the husband's obligations to the bride, but it would also contain, I found this very interesting and amazing, it would also contain a will within that if the husband dies, all that he has goes to his wife. Now, I thought that was, that was pretty, um, there's going to be more to it when we get to some other scriptures and you're going to say, oh, now that makes sense. Okay, so now hold I see on that. now, with this will, uh-huh. uh, where, with the, how, how does... Are you saying that relates to to Christ's death and that? Don't go ahead of me, Matt. Don't go ahead of me, Matt. There, there, yes, and and there's a scripture for that too. So it's really, really cool. Um, but so the husband, the rabbi reads out the husband's obligations to the bride, contains a will at that point. Then he signs it, 
And then you know what she does? And this is pretty cool too. She keeps it forever. And, and I think, you know, in the Old Testament, well, it's actually in the New Testament, where, and I just read it um, in the Gospel of Mark this morning, where um, the smarty pants uh, Jewish leaders come to Jesus and say, hey, what about divorce? What do you think about that? And they're just trying to trap him. And, and uh, he basically says, what, what, what God brings together, let man not separate. And they're like, well, what about Moses? You know, did Moses say we could have a certificate of divorce? And Jesus said that's because their hearts were hard. But that certificate of divorce... You know, you think of a marriage license, that's something written. And so the certificate of divorce would kind of trump that, that other certificate of marriage. So I think that's, that's obviously what they did. She would have had this, this document that she would have kept. Now, back in those times, I mean, it got really, really nasty that basically a Jewish man could literally divorce his wife over anything. I think one of the rabbis at some point I had heard said something along the lines like if she toasted his bread too dark, he could, he could just boot her. He could just write her a certificate of divorce. That was it. And that's why Jesus said it's because their hearts were hard. It, you know, it wasn't just to... And Jesus, when he talks about divorce, number one, God hates divorce. But I guess if there's any any aspect of it that is, I don't want to say permitted, but justified, it's, it's marital unfaithfulness. And Jesus says that. Um, he talks about, you know, if, if one divorces and marries another, they commit adultery um, against that person or with the, the person that they married. But he says sexual immorality. And the reason being for that, and I've explained this to, to people, the big point of marriage, the big picture of marriage is between Christ and the church. That's from Ephesians 5. That's really what it all boils down to. As I go through um, pre-marriage counseling, that's what we're teaching. Not just, oh, marriage is about love, and, and oh, it's all going to, you know, if you, you fall in love, then you're in trouble. In fact, it's just the opposite. What, what I'm teaching through this, this book is that there is love, but it is so much deeper than love. And um, the aspect that, that it, is, it is a commitment aspect of it. So anyway, as we go through it, it's, it's about this, this momentary marriage, which is our marriage here. But the bigger picture of that is Christ and the church. And so explaining that to people, um, you know, you really want them to understand, while well, marriage isn't just, hey, I found a woman, she found me, we like each other. It's reflecting something, even non-Christians, that's why I believe God honors marriage. He honors biblical marriage between a man and a woman because it is a glorifying aspect to his father or to the father to the son being sent for his bride. That's that's the big picture in all this. So when you have an earthly marriage and there is infidelity, what does that do for the big picture of Christ and the church? Is there is anything going to separate us from, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, so there is no... When we come to faith in Christ, and let me kind of work on, on this a little bit. When we come to faith in Christ, what have we done? We've forsaken every other religion. We've forsaken every other thing that we thought was going to earn us salvation. We forsake, um, we forsake everything for Him. And so when we do that, there's not room, because then we have the Holy Spirit, Right? And, and I am a firm believer that when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, nothing else is getting in. Okay? Stuff can oppress, but nothing else is getting in. So there's your, your marriage relationship. So if, the, if the, the smaller picture of that is between a man, a physical man, and a physical woman, and infidelity takes place, it, it destroys that picture. And so I think... For sexual immorality, that's, that's why Jesus said that. Because again, what broke the covenant between God and Israel? What did they do? They went after other gods. And what, what did God call that? Spiritual mm-hmm. idolatry. I mean, spiritual uh, adultery. adultery. adultery yeah. So there, that broke that covenant. And so I think, and, and you know, when I, when I lay it side by side, I can understand then why Jesus says it's sexual immorality that's, is God, does God want that? Does God want a marriage healed if that does take place? Absolutely. But when that happens, it just it breaks the picture apart of Christ in the church. And then it also reflects back on 
God as the husband to Israel and Israel committing spiritual adultery. And that broke the contract. So anyway, I hope I didn't lose you on that. Um, I was, that was no, We chased a rabbit. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, I want to go back. Oh, I'll, let me, before I did this. Okay, the, um, the marriage contract, it states... I did say this. The rabbi reads it aloud. Did I say that? Okay, so in the ceremony, the rabbi's reading it out loud. It contains the will. The husband then comes to sign it, or the groom does, and then the bride keeps it. That's hers. That is something very, very precious to her. I don't want you to turn there. I'm going to turn there really quick to Exodus chapter 24. I'm just going to read one verse. Uh, Verse 7. Okay. It says, then he, and this is, this is talking about Moses, then he took the book of the covenant, so there's our, there's our language marker, and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So there's that aspect in the Old Testament with God. There's the marriage contract. He's read it out. You know, Moses acting sort of as the rabbi in this marriage. He's read it out to the nation of Israel, um, and, and they're agreeing to it. They're going to keep it. And basically... They don't keep it. It breaks. The marriage contract falls apart. So anyway, so we're at this. And then, again, that's why the, the ketubah, that's why it means written thing. That's why marriage contract is, is as it is. So now let's let this kind of transfer into the church, the, the ketubah or the marriage contract with the church. So turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We're going to be flipping around. They're pretty easy books, like Luke, mm-hmm. Matthew, Hebrews. That's, that's kind of where we're going to be. I'm not going to make you turn to the prophet of Joel or anything. So, <laughs> Joel's one of those. Poor, poor book. I always skip over Joel. You know, I'm looking forward. It's like you're back and forth. Okay, uh, Luke 22, verse 20, if somebody wants to, somebody wants to read that. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying... This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Okay. Now, we also know that's repeated in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and that's what we often do when we take the Lord's Supper. In, well, let's look at the language. There's a covenant aspect of it. And what is the covenant now in? Or the new covenant? Because remember, the old covenant was broken. So if there's an old one, or if there's a new one, there had to be an old one. And if there's an old one... There has to be a new one. It's kind of like, um, Mary Sue, you talked about, you, you taught like PowerPoints and stuff like that. Um, and if you ever do outlines, if you have an A, you got to have a what? You got to have a B. If you have a, an A number one, you better have a point number two. So you have to, so basically, if there is a new covenant, there has to be an old covenant. Or rather, if there's an old covenant, there's going to be a new covenant. Or else it's just a covenant. Does that, does that make sense? It's one of my pet peeves. Does anybody know what one of my pet peeves is? When somebody says the first annual, it drives me crazy. There's no such thing as a first annual. Because to be annual, you have to have a second one. So it's the first ever. So if you notice when we had our chili cook-off, it said first ever chili cook-off, not first annual. I see it all the time, and every time I do, my wife laughs at me because it's just... You know, you get those pet peeves. That's one of them. There's no such thing as... That's harmless. It is harmless. It's not like I'm going to attack anybody or anything like that. I do want to get a shirt, though. That'd be pretty cool. There's no such thing as a first annual. But anyway, so we find out Jesus saying here, and again, Paul repeats it during the, the process of the Lord's Supper. This cup is poured out for you in the new covenant in my blood. So the new covenant, which is taking the place of the old covenant, is something that is written in blood. And that's, that's an important aspect of it. And it's being poured out. So now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 28 through 30. Yeah, verses 28 through 30. If anybody wants to, they've got it and you want to read it. I'll read it. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like the one of these. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe the, you, 
Oh, you have little faith. All right, you stop right there. Remember what I said. What what takes place when the marriage contract is read? What's what's contained in it? The husband's obligations. So first off, we find out from Jesus that that there's a new covenant. And it's in his blood. And then what we find out here is he is telling the people that he's preaching to during the Beatitudes and this, this aspect where he's the Sermon on the Mount, where he's there. And, and what is he, what is he going to do for, for his bride? What's he telling her? Yeah, don't be worried about what you're going to wear. Who's going to take care of that? <coughs> he is. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Who's going to take care of that? He is. So there's that aspect now of the husband's obligations being laid out to the bride. You know, and, and it's really neat. I, I've been able in the last couple of weeks to to share those scripture verses with people who who are anxious about these things. To to let them just have it soak in that if if you are a son of or a child of God. Through Christ, because that's really how we become children of God, not just in creation, but, but in being born again or adopted by Him. But more so to be a bride of, of Jesus, there is a provisional aspect that He's going to do. He's going to care for you. He's going to, um, He says, don't, don't be anxious about it. Don't, don't, don't fret about this. You know, you think about it, you become, yes, we're a child of the King, but we're also a bride of the Son of God. And so here is that kind of aspect of I'm going to take care of the husband's obligations. It's, it's, it's all there. Now let's get into that second part. Turn to, in the book of Hebrews and we will start in... I'm going to read one verse. You guys turn to... Somebody turn to Hebrews 9.15. I'm going to read verse 8.13. Where are you? Okay, I'm going to read 8.13. Does anybody have 9.15 that we can jump? You got it? Okay, 8.13, Hebrews 8.13 says, In speaking of a new covenant, so there's our language, there we understand. Now we understand what we're dealing with because that's a new covenant that Jesus is, is instituting. And how is it, how's it taking place? How is it going to be bought, I guess, or, or be brought to, to pass? With his blood. So he, the, the writer of Hebrews says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, which would be the what? Old covenant, which was what? Broken. So, it, you know, think about how, how horrible this would be. If we knew there was an old, or if there was, we won't say old or new, there was just a covenant, one covenant, and it was broke. And that ended it. That's it. We'd have no hope. We would have no ability to, to come back into that right relationship, nor would Israel. I mean, because basically now, and this is, this is the point of it, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the, the first one obsolete, which is becoming obsolete and growing old, um, is ready to vanish away. How, how does Israel now come back into that right relationship as God is their husband? Same way we do. Through Christ, through the Messiah. So you realize now that it would be sad if there was just one covenant and it was broke. We're not, we're not getting in, nor is Israel being, being restored to the Father. It's, it's a broken covenant. It's a severed action. So there's nothing. You know What was written is now blotted out. So it's gone. It doesn't exist. But there is a new covenant. And of course, we know now Jesus speaking about his blood. It's a new covenant and he's making the first one obsolete. Now, Matt, if you want to read 9.15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. All right. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Okay. Remember when the marriage contract is read now, let's place ourselves at that, that, that wedding. It, it states the husband's obligations, which we've, we've heard what that is. I'm going to pour out my blood for you. Uh, I'm going to clothe you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to, I'm going to meet your needs. Remember what the second half was? What, what did it contain for the bride? The will. The will. The will. Okay. The will. So Matt just read, therefore, he is the mediator. Speaking of Jesus, let me, let me jump ahead. Mm-hmm. Stay where you are. I'm just going to read this just so, so you're not taking my word for it. Um, chapter 12, verse 24 of Hebrews, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So 
you know, we're kind of, we're going this far. So you know, without a doubt, that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So we have the new covenant, we have the mediator, we have Jesus, and we have blood. Now go back to what we read that Matt read. Therefore he, now we know who the he is, Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant. Now we understand it's a new covenant by Jesus, by his blood. We understand within that covenant, he's going to take care of his bride so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. How do you get an inheritance? What has to take place? Somebody has to die. Somebody has to die. So the inherit, the internal inheritance, since a death has occurred, now through this death, what happens? That redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So the first covenant severed the relationship. But in the second covenant, the second marriage contract, if you want to call it that, Jesus says, I'm going to take care of you. And, and nothing's going to happen to you. And so there also, in that sense, there is kind of a will. You're going to be with me forever and ever and ever. I'm going to give you, if we come to Jesus and we believe in him, what does he give us in return? Eternal Eternal life. life. So here is the mediator saying that um, those who are called may receive the promised eternal, eternal inheritance. So there's that inheritance aspect since a death has occurred. So Jesus, he makes these these proclamations that, hey, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to pour out my blood for you. Here's the will. That if I die, you get this. So you, can you see how all this is fitting together? Because he had to die for us to get eternal life. And so that, there's that kind of idea that we receive as the bride because it's written in the marriage contract that our inheritance will be eternal life. And he did die. So it's, it's pretty amazing how all that kind of wraps up in that Jesus is the mediator. He's the go-between. But he's the one that promised you and I, or anybody who comes to faith in Christ. Now we look at it now retrospectively, but, but it still holds true. Jesus, when he was a liar, before he died, before he went to the cross, he made those obligations to the bride. He made the proclamation, I'm pouring out my blood. He made the proclamation, I'm going to care for you. And then in that aspect, he also made the proclamation that I'm going to give you eternal life. Now, when he initially said, whosoever believes in me, they will have eternal life, he didn't mention his death at that point. But the point of it now that we see that this eternal life that we get is not just eternal life, it's an eternal inheritance. And an inheritance only comes if there is a death, and the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So there's that idea of, of the, the written thing, the marriage contract. Bless you. It's been stated, and now we see it coming to pass. So it's all been laid out. Now, and this is where it kind of gets out of the order, and I'm really not even trying to keep it in the order of a Jewish wedding. Um, But you'll remember as we went through the Old Testament, we went through the matchmaker, we went through the betrothal period, we went through the marriage contract, the bride price. Does anybody remember what takes place after that? And this would be more along the lines, I don't know if this would be in a ceremony, but let's kind of walk through the process. The matchmaker finds, um, finds a Jewish woman, there's a Jewish young man, brings him together, and he comes and, and he basically does what we just read Jesus did. He states kind of what's going to take place, I'm going to care for you, and, and offers the bride price and all this stuff. Remember what she has to do? Do you remember? The cup of acceptance. Yeah, the cup of acceptance. Remember that? Now, in that sense, they would pour actually a glass of wine, and she, would, she hears all this, and if she drinks it, he's golden. But if she doesn't, there's, it's, it's not, it's it's not going to happen. So there's that aspect of the cup of acceptance. And we kind of read it in the Old Testament, sort of with from Exodus 24-7, where Moses reads the law to them, and what do they say? All that you say, we accept. Yeah, we'll do this. And so there's the cup of acceptance from there. Um, in a Jewish wedding, there's two cups of wine. Were there two cups of wine when you were... Okay. Well, in an Orthodox Jewish wedding, there's two cups of wine. The second one, and we're not really going to hit this one, would be what's, what's called the seven blessings. But the first one is what's called a betrothal blessing. And it's, it's actually called, sometimes it's called the, the Kedushin. Anybody remember, ever hear that word before? You have heard yeah. that word before. <laughs> Kedushin is the root word where we get Jewish wedding. So it's kind of in there. But the Kedush 
is the sanctification prayer that's done oftentimes in, um, in the Passover meal and these kind of things. So here's the idea. The covenant, the new covenant has been laid out. Jesus said, how's he going to do it? He's going to pour out his blood. So what do we have to do as acceptance of that? And we're, I'm kind of throwing terms around. I hope I'm not losing you. In the marriage contract, he states the new covenant. It will be poured out by his blood. So now it's on us. What do we have to do? Yeah, yeah, we got to accept it. We got to drink that cup of acceptance. How do we do that? Turn to John chapter 6. Verse 53. John chapter 6, verse 53. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink Drink his his blood, blood, you have no life in you. There it is. Now, we understand what that means. Now, um, back in those times in in the early church, they were like, oh, man, they're cannibals. They're eating his flesh. They're drinking his blood. It's it's horrific, you know. And and people that would would scoff at at Christianity would read that and be like, oh, that's insane. Um, our, Our Catholic friends look at this completely different. They look at transubstantiation where the, the, the bread really becomes the, the body of Christ and the blood really becomes the blood of Christ. We don't look at it like that. Um, it's, it's still a sacred ceremony, but it's one done in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. So what does it mean then to, to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood? What does that mean for us? It means to take Him into yourself. Yeah, to, to place your faith, to, yeah. to trust Him, to, to reach out to look at the cross and see that, yes, he's dying for my sins. And what is he doing to fulfill that marriage contract? He's pouring out his blood. The blood is poured, and so it sits before us in a cup. And what do we have to do? We've got to bring it to our lips and say, I accept. I accept all that you have laid out. I accept what you said you're going to do. I accept what you've done. And I bring that cup to my lips. And this is us coming to faith in Christ. And it's not... It's not a work. You know, you don't, you don't earn your salvation. To, I mean, when anybody, you know, you, you go home, you're thirsty, you take a drink. Do you go, man, that wore me out. I mean, that's not a work. It's not, it's just something so simple. So to, to reach out in faith, you're not saved by your works. It's very, very clear in, in, in Paul's epistles that you're not saved by your works. So as we reach out and we take hold of that cup in which the blood of Jesus has been poured out, we are accepting him. That's our cup of acceptance. It's our faith in Christ. And we are saying, yes, we accept all that you've done. We drink of the blood that you've shed for us. We're, we're buying in to the marriage contract. So we're in. So I'm jumping ahead. I'm not going to teach on this. But let's, let's think about our lives in Christ. Um, Holy Spirit's working on our heart. And the Bible's very clear. No one comes to the Father unless, unless the Holy Spirit draws them. No one, or unless they are drawn. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. So the Holy Spirit's working on us, convicting us. Um, not just convicting us about sin, but about our need of Christ and what He did for us on the cross. So we come to faith in Christ. We take that cup of acceptance. We drink it. What would be the next step that we would do? Baptism. Baptism. Mm-hmm. And you guys remember, as we go through a Greek Orthodox wedding... Greek, Jewish, <laughs> Greek, Orthodox and Greek to me just are kind of like peanut butter and jelly. They go together so beautifully that sometimes it blurts out. Um, so you remember we had the matchmaker, um, we had the marriage contract, we had the bride price, cup of acceptance, and then we had the mikvah. Do you anybody remember what the mikvah is? That's when she purifies her. Yeah, that's that ceremonial cleansing, cleansing yes. which is a baptism. Yeah. That's where the betrothal period starts. And it's really neat. Um, anybody, you ever been to the Holy Land? I know you traveled a lot. I don't know if you ever have made it. Yeah, I don't know if you can, no, your family. Really want to. Yeah, I'd like to. Have you? <laughs> no. Nope, nobody? My parents have. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you'd My ever. Went many times. Cool. Well, here's, here's an interesting thing that I just found out a couple weeks ago. If anybody has gone to the Holy Land prior to 2010, I think it was. Um, and you're going to all the sites and stuff like that, you would have gone to the pool of Siloam or Siloam. Um, and they would have taken you there, and then obviously they would have shared. You guys remember what happened at the yeah. pool of Siloam? Yeah. That's where Jesus tells the man to go and wash, and he'll receive his sight, and he does it. Well, 
If you went there before 2010, you went to the wrong place. Because in 2010, they actually found the yes. real pool of Siloam. Because what happened was, and if I'm getting the story right, they wanted to build a parking lot. And this is kind of the way it is in, in um, archaeology in Israel. If you want to do anything, any kind of building, you know, they, they, you know, they're always constructing things. It's not that big of a deal. But prior to that, they're going to do some digging. Because, I mean, the, the, the city, when you think about actually the city of David, when you think about Jerusalem, not as we know it now, but as it was with the wall, it's only like one kilometer by one kilometer. Very, very small. So you think of all that stuff just kind of being so compressed in such a small area. And so what did they do? They built up. So basically now they want to build um, a parking lot for whatever reason. And so they say, yeah, you can build your parking lot, but we're going to dig. And so as they're digging, and I, and I watched an interview with a guy who discovered this, they're digging and they hit this, they hit this rock. And, you know, the diggers, they're just still digging. The guy's like, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's figure out what this rock is. And so they go and they dig and they realize it's steps. And so he's like, okay, I have steps. And then they dig more and they realize it's a big pool. And it's actually connected to the temple. Yeah. which makes perfect sense. Where the other pool of Siloam is not connected to the temple. They have a kind of a... Well, and that is why they think they, they might not have the temple location correct because of this discovery now, right. which would make the temple mount and some... It, it's just kind of... It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, you, you know, know... The way things are going to work and again, out might be different. Anything in archaeology, unless you actually have it written out, <clears throat> and even if you have it written out, have you guys ever heard of James Ossuary? An ossuary is a, is, a, is a box, normally of limestone, that would contain bones. And they actually have an ossuary that says, James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And they have that, and, and man, they held big, big, I, don't, I think it was even in court, to find out if this guy falsified this. And, and come to find out he didn't falsify it. And, and it's kind of neat that they may have found the burial or some burial bones of James, who was the half-brother of Jesus. But nonetheless, they would have written that on there. Um, but again, any, most of archaeology, even if you have something written on it, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Because you just don't know, because we're not there. And you know, even historians who write things, sometimes they skew it and things get, get skewed. So you make a good point that... Man, if we screw up, is the temple actually not here? Um, but it makes good sense that the, that the place for the mikvah, the, the pool of Siloam, would be close to the temple. Because you would want to be cleansed before you would enter into the temple. So it makes good sense that there's going to be that, that connection aspect. But remember the bride. She would go in there and she would have her bridesmaids around us and she would enter into that water. And it was ceremonial, but it was cleansing. And what is she, what is she cleansing off of her? You guys remember in the Orthodox Jewish wedding? What is she kind of, what is she letting just float away? Anybody remember? What would you think? Their experiences. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. And, and they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been um, sexual experiences. Because remember, in a Jewish wedding, it is all about the purity of the bride. That's a huge, huge aspect within the wedding. But every other man or thought or opportunity to go in a direction of anybody and of any other groom is it's gone it's done and she comes out of that water and remember she wears that veil and what is she doing at that point that's where they enter into that betrothal she's period committed to she him. is totally committed to him when she goes out she's got that veil on and what is that telling people is she she's in Jerusalem yeah not available I got one spoken for me and where's he gone He's gone off to prepare a place for me. And, and he hasn't come back yet, but I'm waiting on him. And so don't talk to me. You know, if you got your interest in me, don't do it because I'm not interested in you. I have a bridegroom and he's gone to his father's house and he's gone to, to add a building onto that house that he's going to come. And I don't know when he's coming. And we're kind of jumping ahead, but it, I, I can't stop now. This is actually what would happen in a wedding. He's coming back to get me. I don't know when he's coming, but we talked about it, that often it was at night because he would have been building all day and then finally come to that point and say, Dad, how is it? Yeah. So I can go get your bride. Bam! He doesn't wait because he's been doing this sometimes up to two years, trying to prepare a place for his bride to come. That's the, George, remember what that's called? Hoopah! 
That's it. That's it. Now, in a wedding, they kind of have the canopy and stuff because they, obviously they can't do it that way. And that's why the wedding re- um, represents a lot of this stuff. But when he gets the okay from his dad, he's gone. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, and that's why we'll get into this, that's why with the virgins who have their lamps filled, some have oil, some don't, they got to be ready at night because that's normally when he came because he'd been working all through the day. And finally, you know, the last... You guys know in construction, what's the last thing you do? Clean up. (laughs) You clean it up. You know, you're out sweeping, you're getting it perfect and everything. And then it passes inspection. He goes to get his bride. She's got her veil on. She's got her lamp full of oil. She's got the trim. She's waiting. When she hears that procession coming, she has no time to go and and buy oil. I mean, that, that should have been taken care of. And so, and... In those days, she would have had a lamp sitting next to her bed, and she would have had extra oil there too because she didn't know when he was coming. But man, when she was coming, or when he was coming, and she knew it because there'd be the trumpet blast. Remember, the shofar would be being blown. She'd hear that, and she'd know, my my groom comes for me. And so when you you hear it all laid out like that, that is the return of Christ. That's, That's why Jesus now, that's why we are now in this betrothal period. Um, the matchmakers come, the Holy Spirit has done his work, or you know, even somebody who's discipled you. Now we're, we'll include that. Marriage contract's been stated. Jesus has said, this is a new covenant. I'm pouring out my blood. I'm going to care for you. I will be your husband ultimately. We have placed our faith in him, and we have drank in that cup of acceptance. I guess I don't need to teach on the mikvah next week because we talked about it, and that's pretty much enough because you'll remember, and I'll, I'll just end with this, Matthew chapter 28. This is why we do what we do and how we do it. Um, And Claire, we talked about this. I think we talked about Matthew 28 on Friday. If we didn't, we should have. But anyway, here's Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus said to them, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. So we realize now to make a disciple... You're part of that matchmaker aspect. And for somebody to be a disciple, they have to do what? Drink that cup of acceptance. And then what's the next thing? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's, that's the next step. And that is symbolic of that ceremonial cleansing because what happens, and then after that, what Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What happens at the end of the age? He comes back. He comes back. So now we have his Holy Spirit, but but the point of that is that's where our lives are orchestrated around his return. We don't know when he's coming, but we're going to live out our days. We are now in that betrothal period. Now we're there's no doubt that he's he's not going to renege in this contract. I mean it's done, he's already shed his blood. We're in the marriage contract, but things still have to take place. We have to go somewhere. And he's got to prepare that place for us. That's why he's doing it. And it is interesting because um, they do often say, and I don't know if they said this to correlate with how long it's been. Um, They say it can take up to two years. Well, if a thousand years is like a day, uh, you know, I don't know, you figure all that out. Either we got a really long time to wait or it could be right now. I don't know. I'm not even going to try to get into that. But the point of it is, is that he's gone to prepare a place for us. But as in the Jewish wedding, the groom would have to, there was a separation. It was a painful thing. But again, she's not just sitting there twiddling her thumbs like, I'm so bored. You know, what do I do? She is orchestrating her life. She's in a betrothal period. She's going about and she's testifying. She walks outside. She's got that veil on. She's testifying to the world. I'm betrothed. We've gone through this process. My groom has, has, has given me the price or he's laid out a contract He's going to keep it. He's told what he's going to do for me. There's there's a will aspect. I've got an inheritance. I've accepted this. I've taken that cup of acceptance. And so we, as we live our lives, what do we do? We testify. We're in this betrothal period. We're testifying that he's coming back. We're testifying what he's done for us, that he's our bra or our groom, that we are in a relationship with Christ. And I think that's that's the big difference, and you hear it a lot, and, and I don't think I can hear it enough. Um, Christ is not about religion, it's about a relationship. Because what was the first covenant about? Religion. religion. It broke. 
And so Jesus, and remember, it's obsolete now. So we have grown. It's not so much God is is distant. You know, we're, we're trying to be religious to appease him. That old covenant's obsolete. Now we are in a relationship well, with him. Well, that's what the Cypher's asked from other religions, too. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, like, if, if you look at the Greeks, the world, I mean, or even Hinduism, you know, it's a... It's a even it's Islam. A creator, yeah. It's yeah, the same thing. created, but there's no... Yeah. I don't stay constant in your life at all. Yeah, it's almost a deist aspect where God's created stuff, and then he's kind of moved away. Yeah. But he's still God, which means he can crush any time he wants, so you better appease him. And that's pretty much all the world religions. Um, uh, um, oh, what am I thinking? Oh, what is the, the worship of, of Mother Earth? I can't remember what, the, what I'm trying to think of. New Age. Yeah, but there's a, there was a word. Maybe I was thinking of a Spanish word. Anyway, um, the point of it is it's all about appeasement. It's all about appeasing a God so this God doesn't crush you. And you're right. We, we're we not appeasing God. We want to please Him. I want to please Him. But pleasing and appeasement are two different things. Appeasement is is religion. Pleasing is relationship. We do it out of love. Yeah, we do it. Because He loved us. That's it. That's exactly it. So it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So anyway, that's as far as we're going to go. Is all, this, is all this making sense? Mm-hmm. No, it's good. It's Are you seeing some, some value in the study? I'd be sad if you, if you didn't. But I, I hope we are because, I mean, it really... And I want it to help us understand some things that Jesus has said. And at the same time, I want it to, um, I want it to change us. When we walk out of here, I want us to walk out with a renewed veil over us that I am testifying to the fact that I am betrothed. I am in a betrothal period. I am living for one who is coming back for me. And remember, I don't want. I mean, We've got the will. Yeah, we got the will. The will to be in effect. Somebody has. We to got die. the death. Die. Yeah. So yeah. that's just surety of eternal yeah. life. You know. Sorry. That's okay. I just want to hear what your password is. No. Um, and let me let me tell you guys this too. And I'm not taking a shot at other denominations per se, but it is kind of sad that when you read or when you get it laid out like we have it laid out here, to think that salvation isn't eternal, you don't get that from a marriage contract. It's an eternal inheritance promised by Jesus. And to have an inheritance, a death has to occur. That can't be taken away. And so, again, that, that, you know, those who believe you can lose your salvation. What's that? Even once it's renounced. Because, I mean, I've heard different No, because you're in the palm of His hand. Right. And, and you are in the palm of His hand, and then it speaks about being in the palm of the Father's hand, and then I and the Father are one. That basically, and Jesus says, uh, those who left us, they weren't part of us anyway. That's right. And here's the thing, Claire. You have you have a father, yeah. okay? He is your father. Yeah. Let's say you get angry at your father so much that you say, you're not my father anymore. Is he still your father? Yes. Yeah, he's still your father. So you think of that. If somebody is truly in a relationship with Christ, and then they say, I'm not in a relationship with you anymore. Blood's been shed. A price has been paid. A contract has been dealt with. All of these things have taken place. Even though you're saying this, and 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 I, you know, if somebody were in this, almost real soon, very soon. If if that happens, I would certainly want to counsel somebody and, and, and ask them, "Are you? Did you truly come to faith in Christ?" Um, but if they had, you, you can't get out of it because you're bought. You can't. If you're purchased. He will chasten you unto death. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. You're in it. I mean, I'm sure you have taken of that cup and you drank it. You can't regurgitate that. I mean, it's done. It's it's a done deal. A transaction's taken place. Um, so again, somebody that would renounce their faith in Christ, I would start off by asking them flat out, "Did you ever have faith in Christ?" Because yeah, we go through. Difficult times. We go through challenging times. We may even backslide, but that's not a renouncing of the faith. That's 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 sanctification. That's allowing too much of the world and the flesh in, and these kind of things. And I think most people who fall into those categories, um, I think deep down they know they know they're they're the Lord's because the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. They know they're doing wrong. Um, but, but again, I think the Scripture, well, I know the Scripture is very, very clear that 
time, and here's, here's a point that I've used with people about losing their salvation. If Jesus said, whosoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting or eternal life, and you could lose that, then that's not eternal, mm-hmm. which means he's a liar. He said what he said. It's not just semantics. He's not just kind of throwing it out there. And it's not really long. You know, you can't take really long and eternal and say, oh, they mean the same thing. They don't. They, in fact, mean polar opposites because really long is time. Eternal is not. And so for him to say, I give them eternal life, means that it is just that. It's eternal. And, and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that idea of plucking, nothing's going to pluck you out of his hand. And the strength of that is you can't pluck yourself. You're held by the almighty hand of God. (laughs) You're not getting out of that. Um, But again, he will pursue you. What does he do? If there's a hundred and one goes away, he leaves 99, he goes after you. Because again, what did Hosea do? Let's let's kind of take it back to that. Gomer went off, um, had, had... extramarital relationships, had children, what did Gomer, or what did Hosea do? He went back and he paid a price and he got her back. And that's not Jesus has to reshed his blood for somebody, but the point of it is, is I think with, with a, a wayward Christian, I think they need to be reminded that the blood has been shed for them. That's why we do the Lord's Supper, because we forget, but we do this in remembrance of him. It's, it's, my wife came to me, and I'm going to say this on, on... You were there when she said it. What does she want on her 20th anniversary? To get her vows Yeah, my wife wants well, our vows ring. ring. Yeah, and a ring. We're ring. not talking about the ring. <laughs> yeah, my wife said, I want... I would love... And she said it... And Claire was a witness to this, and I agreed to it, so I'm stuck. Um, now I'm really stuck. Yeah. Um, yeah, on our 20th anniversary, she wants... And we're... We'll be 18 this year, so she, she's given me a couple of years <laughs> to work with this. She wants to renew our vows, and you know, she wants like a, a new. Uh, she, and to be honest, um, the uh, the ring I originally got her as an engagement ring was pretty crappy. I mean, I didn't have much money. I knew what I was doing, you know. And she wants a nice one. I said, okay. So she's given me two years to work on all this. Um, so I need to make the most of it. <laughs> but ultimately. Check, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you, you did better than Well, I don't know. My wife probably would have preferred that after the ring. Because, again, I didn't know what I was doing. Said, go pick out which one. I said, baby, this is about the love. It's not about the diamond. So anyway, <laughs> but when you think about that, when we take the Lord's Supper, what are we doing? We take that cup of acceptance. So what are we? We're renewing our vows to, to our, our... Yeah, that'll definitely word. have a, a new meaning for me taking the Lord's Supper. Yeah. I've never... Yeah looked at it, you know, when Jesus offered that cup to his disciples, right. you know, as they celebrated at the Passover, they were taking that cup of, they accepted that new covenant in his blood. Right. And of course, you know, we don't look at it as sacramental. You know, you don't take that cup that we do and it saves you. You know, it doesn't work right. like that. Right. We do it in remembrance of him and we remember, we renew, you know, and that's, that's, that's a beautiful picture. But I'll end on this, and just this is the reminder of, of the Kedushin. That's the, uh, in the Kedush, that's the, that's the sanctification cup, but it's also the Jewish wedding. To take someone or something that others might see as ordinary and to separate it out, to distinguish it. You know, separate out, that's holiness. <coughs> We're called to be holy, to distinguish. There's that sanctification. We're, di- we're different than the world. We are a peculiar people in Christ. We have to be. And then to elevate it to a holy purpose. What do we become? We become priests. Yeah. And, and we are elevated to a holy purpose. What is that holy purpose? To glorify Him. Amen. So that's, yeah. My mother always said, we are not different than other people, but we are expected to witness and to testify. We're no better. No, we're, yeah, that probably be, we're no better. We are different. Yeah, um, different. We have to be different because we've been... We've been changed, we've been forgiven, we've been cleansed, we have the Spirit, but we're not better. Like, we don't, we don't, here's the thing about judgment, and, and I'm really going to chase a rabbit here. Um, in the scripture, Paul talks about judgment, and how there is a time for judgment, but that's within the church, and when something's going on, he says, you guys need to, to judge within, but you don't judge without. You don't judge the world who's living like sinners as if they should be Christians. That's the worst thing the church can do. And this is a big, big danger because um, I see it horribly. I think it's 
when, when the church, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump on another hot topic, with homosexuality, if the church <coughs> approaches homosexuals thinking in the sense that if you renounce your homosexuality, you're good. You're not good. You're still going to hell. It's, it's about coming to faith in Christ and renouncing all of those sinful things. It's about repentance. And if, if that's your lifestyle of sin, it could be you're a prostitute or you're promiscuous yeah. or you're a drug user. You know, it's, a, it's the same kind of aspect. You, you, you renounce all those things. You turn from them, you repent, and you move in the direction of God. So we as the church, one of the worst things we can do is either get upset or make it seem like uh, non-Christians, you got to act like Christians. Because... Because then ultimately what we're saying is it's about morality, it's about action, it's about performance. And if you act like us, then you're us. You're in. Mm -hmm. Not true.